Pennsylvania out in the backwoods and it's just a beautiful, beautiful country up in Pennsylvania. I remember years ago driving up through this state and just thinking about how beautiful it was. You normally, I guess people in the South, I think Pennsylvania, we forget that there's forest and trees and mountains and all the beauty that Pennsylvania has to offer and also the, the, the wonderful family uh, that invited us up here, the group here that they have. Uh, the fellowship <clears throat> is just really a blessing. And of course, in the folks from other different parts of Pennsylvania and even all the way down to uh, Maryland, we had a brother from, from Maryland come up and uh, New York, even all the way up into Chicago and of course many other places there. But a lot of people even from Pennsylvania came in uh, that were able to, to meet other believers of like mind here uh, in the state here with uh, uh, Sister Brandy and her husband Keith that invited us uh, to come down, her mom Sue and her sister as well. Um, uh, just uh, Darcy, that is, and just just a marvelous uh, group of people here. But I, I was looking at Zaphaniah, and uh, the, this morning, actually, my wife is the one that kind of brought it to my attention. And uh, looking at Zaphaniah chapter two and chapter three, and you know, I've spoken on chapter three many times before because it speaks about God's wrath. Uh, a lot of people don't pay attention to that, but it speaks about God's wrath is what it does. But I want to back up to chapter 2 and just kind of go through it with you guys. It's kind of like a no frills there uh, type video here. Uh, we're about, we're, soon we're going to have our new intro put together. We've got a brother down in uh, Africa that's putting that together for us. And I, I still got to get back with him. Uh, so, by the way, Sister L'Oreal, if you happen to see this video, if you can get send that wonderful brother a message, just let him know that... Uh, uh, I, I know I haven't got a chance to send him some of the information he still needs, though, but uh, uh, we're going to have a, a nice intro that we'll be able to add to this for you guys. Not too lengthy, but just a nice intro. But anyway, Zephaniah chapter 2, gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation not desired. Think of that. A no nation not desired. Before the decree bring forth, before the day passes, the chaff. You remember, I don't know if you remember the scripture where it says that, you know, that it'll come, uh, you know, and shall burn according to, it's actually in the book of Malachi, uh, shall ne leave them neither uh, root nor branch and shall, you know, uh, I believe it actually uses the word burn them up like the chaff, you know, talking about the, that's what's left over from the wheat when they harvest the field and it's just ends up being burnt is what happens there. So he says in here, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. So this is the final judgment. Seek ye the Lord, all you meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness. Seek, um, uh, seek, uh, uh, whoop, you can make sure I don't want this thing to start beeping on me here. Uh, <clears throat> Seek meekness, it may be, excuse me, back up a little bit. Seek righteousness, seek meekness, it may be uh, you shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. So I've told you that, you know, there there is a scripture that there is a hiding of the righteous, but it's from his indignation, from his wrath when he comes down here to deal with this demonic Nephilim race and those that have refused to heed the call, right? Then he goes on to say, for Gaza shall be forsaken and Ashkelon a desolation. They shall drive out Ashdod at noonday and Ekron shall be rooted up. This is not an army coming into Israel. This is God's anger and judgment coming upon, right? He goes up and says, Woe unto the inhabitants of the sea coast, the nation of the Cherethites. The word of the Lord is against you. O Canaan, the land of the Philistines, it will even destroy you, that there shall be no inhabitant. And the sea coast shall be dwellings, and the cottages for shepherds, and folds for flocks. And the coast shall be for a remnant of the house of Judah. They shall feed thereupon in the houses of Ashkelon, and shall they lie down in the evening. For the Lord their God shall visit them and turn away their captivity. There it again. There, that, it's an amazing. This is where maybe even one of the scriptures, uh, it's not the one that Paul actually uses when he speaks about in Romans 11, verse 25. 
if those natural branches remain not what? In unbelief. They can be regrafted in. Now, what does that mean when he says if they remain not in unbelief? In other words, they would have to believe that Jesus Christ is truly the Son of God. All right? And that's something we totally neglect to pay attention to. It's not that God is coming to save the entire Jewish nation when, you know, I can't even tell you what percentage of it is as part of a Nephilim uh, demonic bloodline bringing about an Illumini, Illuminati uh uh, uh, demonic evil entity of a Sanhedrin New World Order Antichrist system. And then you pastors that are willing to support this, and then you encourage the, the, your laity to go study underneath Talmudic rabbis and saying to them that the Jewish people have something to teach you because you, uh, because they are Jewish and, oh, Jesus was Jewish. Let me tell you something about the Jewish Jesus. He condemned everything they were doing. And yet you mislead the flock and put them underneath this kind of rotten garbage? Shame on you. The coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. They shall feed thereupon in the house of Ashkelon. Shall, shall they lie down, right? In the evening, for the Lord their God shall visit them and turn away their captivity. They're being held captive by Satan, captive by Talmudic tradition, captive by Kabbalah, by Zohar. That's why Paul quotes, the deliverer shall come out of Zion and turn un ungodliness away from Jacob. Listen, we know what the ungodliness is. Jesus come and told us what it was. Oh, my goodness. I have heard the reproach of Moab and the revelings of the children of Ammon, whereby they have reproached my people and magnified themselves against their border. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be as Sodom and the children of Ammon as Gomorrah, even the breeding of nettles and the salt pits and the perpetual desolation. The residue of my people shall spoil them and the remnant of my people shall possess them. Think about that. You know, that's interesting because you remember, this is where people are also getting mixed up in their theology. They're thinking, oh, see, God's got a remnant. So the, the children of Israel with their army is going to go out there and take all these guys out. No, you're not. Did you forget that the scripture says that when he returns, he comes with 10,000s of his saints to bring judgment? It'll be a fiery thing from God. When Christ returns, it's judgment. You have one last little window of opportunity. And it'll even be a little last window, maybe opportunity for the church to repent and get right with God as well, instead of leading their people down the pit to hell. The Lord will be terrible unto them, for he will famish all the gods of the earth. Oh, I know. You know, the Talmudic rabbis tell you that's Jesus believers because they tell you that, oh, you got a new God. Well, you know, in the conference here, we're going to put part of this on, on, on DVD for you guys. But let me tell you something, this conference here, one of the main key things I really hit a lot on is scripture after scripture where God condemns Israel for bringing in multiple gods. That's not the Christian friends. That was Israel that did that. Ye, watch this too. The Lord will be terrible unto them. Okay, uh, we read that. Verse 12, ye Ethiopians, also you shall be slain by my sword. And he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy the Assyrian and will make Nineveh a desolation and a dry like a wilderness. And flocks shall lie down in the midst of her. All the beasts of the nations, both the cormorant uh, and the bittern shall lodge in the upper lintels of it. Their voice shall sing in the windows. Desolation shall be in the thresholds for he shall uncover the cedar work. This is the rejoicing city that dwelt carelessly that said in her heart, I am, and there is none beside me. How has she become a desolation, a, a place for beasts to lie down in? Everyone that passes by her shall, shall hiss and wag his, his, his hand. 
going into Zephaniah chapter 3, woe to her that is filthy and polluted, the oppressing city. She obeyed not the voice. She uh, received not correction. She trusted not in the Lord. She drew not near to her God. Sounds like to me he's talking about this rabbinical authority living in Jerusalem, right? Her princes within her are roaring lions. You know, it does call the, the priests, the Levites, the scripture calls them princes. You didn't know that? Now you do. All right. They gnaw not uh, the bones till the mor uh, morrow. Her prophets are, are, are light and treacherous persons. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. Do you know also that the Levitical, or, or excuse me, the Pharisaic uh, teachers believe that the high priest is considered their prophet? Maybe this is where your false prophet comes from, right? The just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity. Even uh, morning doth he bring his judgment to light. He faileth not, but the unjust knoweth no shame. I have cut off the nations, their towers are desolate. I made their streets waste that, that none passeth by. Their cities are destroyed so that there is no man, that there is none inhabitant. I said, surely thou will fear me. Thou will receive instruction so their dwelling should not be cut off. However, I punished them, but they rose early and corrupted all their doings. I mean, this is just like all the prophets of Israel that have ever condemned the actions that the priests of Israel, the Levites and the Kohanim have taken the children of Israel in from the time of Moses. And Moses, even when he wrote in the 31st Psalm, what did he do? God told him, go and sing this song in their ears. And he put it, he said, I'll put it in the book. He said, put it on the outside of the ark. It'll be a judgment against you in that day, right? Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I will rise up to the prey for my determinations to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. For then will I turn to the people of pure language, and they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. From beyond the rivers to Ethiopia, my suppliants, uh, suppliants, even the daughter of my dispersed shall bring mine offering. Now, let me tell you something. It's interesting. When he talks about bringing all these nations down, right? This is exactly what they're doing right now, creating this new world order. And I actually had this incorrectly taught before, but what it appears to be to me is that when the nations come down, this is when this false priesthood, this Nephilim race, this serpent race that has, that has, moved down through the centuries now, when they woo all the nations in, making this a new world order, God says that they will gather themselves together. They will come down to, to Israel, right? He says, therefore, wait uh, ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day. That's verse eight, that I will rise up to the prey for my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger. And everybody, we've always been thinking in our minds that, well, this is just, the nations come down, they all turn against Israel and he wipes them out. Well, the problem is, okay, I can understand that, but we we totally neglect that, that he's, he's telling you what the priest of Israel and how evil they've been and how what he's going to do with them as well. The only ones that escape is what he said in chapter two. Pray that God will, will hide you in the day of his anger, the meek and the righteous. That little bitty tiny remnant that'll end up believing. And that day, verse 11, we drop back down to where we left off at, where we, verse 10 actually, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my, oh, we read that, okay. Verse 11, in that day shall thou be ashamed for all thy doings, wherein thou hast transgressed against me, for then I will take away out of the midst of thee them that rejoice in thy pride, and thou shalt no more be haughty because of my holy mountain. That's, 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 that's the remnant of the priest and, and, the, and the remnant of the house of Israel, that is, excuse me, the house of uh, Judah, right? I will also leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and the poor. Um, 
I'm going to make sure I read it right. I will also leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. And the remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies. Neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He hath cast out thine enemy, the king of Israel. Even the Lord is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil any more. All right, now you got to pay attention though. And this, see, this is where we, I think we've made a lot of the mistakes there. We're there in verse 15. And he's now turned back and he's talking about that little remnant. But don't forget, when you're back up here in the beginning parts of Zechariah 3, he's talking about the princes of Israel. Within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. They gnaw not, uh, excuse me, they gnaw not the bones to the mar uh, marrow, or like the marrow. Her prophets are light and treacherous persons. And so he brings them and the nation, showing that he's bringing the new world order. Okay, but when it comes to them, he's bringing judgment in his fierce indignation. That's what he says. But then he reflects back because remember in chapter two, he talks about that little remnant. In fact, when he speaks of that little remnant of Judah, it's also kind of interesting. They're not in Jerusalem. The little remnant ain't even allowed in Jerusalem. Isn't it interesting? Some of what we call Karite Jews today, just those that believe in the Bible, they're not Talmudists and stuff. They don't live in Jerusalem. He said they're down there by Ashkelon, by the seacoast. And, and that could be, uh, it could be a, a symbology as well in the language that God is using there. We don't really know. All right, so he says, The Lord hath taken away thy judgment. He has cast out thine enemy. The king of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. Now notice that. Who's in the midst of thee? The Lord. The king of Israel. Well, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Did I forget something here? I think Israel is trying to put in there some kind of a uh, natural king like Netanyahu. And now they want to call Trump the king of Israel. Does did either one of them look like God himself to you? But yet the scripture referred to Jesus Christ as El Gibor. And it even they even said that he was the king of the Jews. He's a king of everything. He's a king of kings, according to the scripture. He is, that is who is in the midst of them. Christ has come down, right? And that day shall be said uh, to Jerusalem, fear thou not, and to Zion, let not thy hands be slack. The Lord thy God in the midst of you is mighty. Yeah, Christ is El Gibor. He will save, he will rejoice over you, will joy, he will rest in his love. He will joy over you with singing, will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly who are of thee to whom the reproach of it was a burden. Behold, at that time I will uh, undo all that afflict you and I will save her that is halted and gather her that was driven out and I will give them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. At that time will I bring you again. Even the time that I gather you, I will make you a name and a praise among all the peoples of the earth when I turn back your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord. The thing is, and let me just say this in closing, friends, what we really got to pay attention to, he distinguishes between what we see happening today Remember I told you Daniel 11, they try to establish the vision, verse 14. The, who is it? The violent among your people. The angel Gabriel told Daniel, the violent among your people will try to establish the, the kingdom. Or excuse me, try to establish the vision. They lift it up. They try to marry it, so to speak. Okay? And what is it? that He's showing you there what we see in Israel today where Netanyahu and, and these rabbis they're all trying to manufacture a millennial reign through violence and through evil. That's not God's way. His way is not like that. And so Zephaniah, when you really pay attention to what's being said in the verses, we find out that he's bringing judgment not only against the priests and Levites that are of the Nephilim race there in Jerusalem, but also bringing all those nations that have supported her and he's allowing the Sanhedrin and stuff to bring them all down, bring them in for judgment. But he also talks clearly too in Zephaniah chapter 2. I mean, he's talking about making things like 
like like Sodom and Gomorrah, and he talks about the, 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 the lime pits, that's because you're talking about raining fire and brimstone on the earth. And he's talking about having to hide his righteous, those faithful ones. He's hiding them so that his indignation doesn't destroy everything. So really, when you go back and read Zephaniah, really pay close attention because he's showing you two different groups there. So when you see Judah, you see there's a little remnant of Judah and you see that there is that remnant from around the globe there. Because see, this is, these are, see, you're Israel when you're in Christ. Let me put it like that so it makes more sense. That's those righteous that he's talking about. Those that believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And then when he says your king is in the midst of you, and he, and he says that it was God himself in the midst of you. That's Jesus Christ. After he's already brought that judgment. And don't, one thing, let me just say this, because even my wife and I, we were discussing a little bit on, on one issue here. That when God hides, when he hides you away from his anger and wrath, and he's wiping the slate clean, you know, we don't know how long all that takes. We, we don't, we don't, maybe sometimes even like when you read scripture, you can read scripture and, and you might have 10, 20 years in between fulfillments and this verse or that verse or 100 years or 1,000 years, like in Isaiah 61. I have no idea. But what we do see clearly when I look at Zephaniah, and I, I actually overlooked this, but it's coming more to me now as I'm starting to see things more clearly by the grace of God. You know, willing to have my heart open to the Spirit of God to know what the truth is and not be blinded by the deception that's going on in the world today. So I just encourage you guys, we love you, and uh, we thank you for you, and we thank you for your love and support for the work that we do. Shalom. In a world of ain't shalom.